evening. I almost said good morning. Last time we did this, it was in the afternoon. Um, I'm very excited today. We have with us Dr. Uh, Vijay Ravindra. I should have asked you that before we started. I always try to do that. Did I say it right? Yeah, you nailed it. Nice. Okay. <laughs> um, really excited for this because Dr. Ravindra is actually the first recipient of a new program we started where the Bobby Jones CSF is um, offering an award for the best Chiari um, research publication as part of the joint section um, for the American, I'm just gonna say AANS and CNS because they're very long, <laughs> but I'm really excited to hear about some of your work and everything that you have going on. But first, I wanna just quickly ask you to introduce yourself, maybe talk a little bit about how you got into studying Chiari and how, why you think this is a very interesting topic. But with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I will make you a presenter and you can get started. Okay. And can you all see my screen okay here? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, speak to you all today. Um, it's a real honor and it was a real honor to receive the award for some of the work that we've done. Um, I'm Vijay Ravindra. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon by training um, and I'm currently practicing at the Naval Medical Center San Diego and Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. Um, I first encountered um, um, an, an interest in Chiari research uh, while doing my residency uh, under the uh, supervision and mentorship of Dr. Douglas Brockmeyer at the University of Utah, who many of you know well as a real leader and thought leader in the uh, field of uh, Chiari malformations and craniocervical junction anomalies. And so since then, um, you know, I've been able to continue this work. And some of the things that I want to talk about today are things that I started while uh, in Utah and hope to continue on uh, for some time now. So we'll just jump right in. Um, this is pretty quick and informal and um, feel free to stop me if, if uh, you feel it's necessary. So so Chiari research, um, and uh, I'm going to emphasize some biomechanical properties and parameters uh, as kind of topics of interest here. So here's the uh, ever popular disclosure slide. And just kind of introducing the topic itself, you know, Chiari malformations, as we all know, have a wide variety of clinical severity and phenotypes, if you will. And uh, this is for children or adults who present with or without syringomyelia. A lot of emphasis has been placed on CSF dynamics and how the flow of CSF in and around the foramen magnum at the craniocervical junction plays into the pathogenesis and subsequent severity of Chiari malformation. Our thought, and, and really this is Dr. Brockmeyer's uh, main idea, is that biomechanics uh, and regional biomechanics and global biomechanics of the spine really play a role in this varying presentation of kids and how they uh, kind of progress over time. So the first part of this talk, we'll talk about defining the role of the condylar C2 sagittal vertical alignment or CC2 SVA, as I'll refer to it as moving forward in Chiari malformation. So the relationship between the occipital bone and the first uh, cervical vertebrae and that subsequent joint, the OC1 joint, and other joints and load-bearing structures below in kids with Chiari malformation is really unknown. And when I say kids throughout this talk, this really stands true for all people with Chiari malformation, but we particularly focused on pediatric patients in these studies. So the joint between the occipital cervical junction or the OC1 joint, um, we know that there's uh, little capsular ligaments that hold this joint together. And these are the primary stabilizers uh, for the craniocervical junction. And this was demonstrated in a study published out of the University of Utah by Dr. Brockmeyer's group with the bioengineers. So when you look at 
biomechanical measurements and parameters, which are widely used in the field of spinal deformity, there's really no mention of the OC1 joint. And we know the OC1 anatomy is really critical in Chiari malformation. So things like the T1 slope that you see on this slide, the neck tilt, the C2 to C7 sagittal vertical axis, and the Cobb angle, although it's very interesting when you're looking at lower down in the cervical spine, it doesn't really play a role when we think about problems at the craniocervical junction per se. So some previous metrics that you all have heard probably a lot about in the past are uh, the CXA or the clivoaxial angle and the PBC2. So I've uh, kind of got this illustration of the CXA here, but the problem with the CXA is it really relies on the position of the odontoid process or the top of C2, which is that peg. Um, but the odontoid itself really isn't biomechanically relevant because it really doesn't bear any load. The first load bearing really comes from the disc below this area. And the PBC2, as indicated here, is not really a bony relationship, it's more of a soft tissue relationship. Now these are both very important for other reasons, but when we talk about uh, Chiari malformation, we're not quite sure that these uh, really describe the area to the best that they could or as needed uh, in this area. So this new measurement that, that really Dr. Brockmeyer came up with was the condylar C2 sagittal vertical axis. This is uh, for short the CC2 SVA. And it's the position of a line that we draw from the midpoint of that joint between OC1 in relation to the C2-3 disc space, which as I mentioned just a bit ago, is the first load-bearing disc or load-bearing structure in the spine moving downward. This uh, slide here is basically just how you measure it, and it's pretty simple. So you start with a midline MRI. You can see this is a midline MRI of a child who's got a Chiari malformation with uh, tonsillar descent, which is not insignificant, all the way down uh, to the level of C2. So what we've done is we've drawn a line parallel, as you can see on the left panel, to the C2-3 disc. And then on the right-sided panel, going out parasagittally, so just scrolling out to the side to the middle of the OC1 joint, which is readily identified, we make a small marker. And then coming back to the midline, or we, we draw a perpendicular line or a plumb line, you might read about, um, perpendicular to our C23 reference line. Now the distance between that perpendicular line and the back part of the C23 disc space is the CC2 SVA. So um, those, it's just a simple measurement that can be done on an MRI in any imaging system that you are able to scroll back and forth. So the primary aim of this initial study was to define the CC2 SVA and to describe it. And we were thinking, just based on experience at a high level, uh, high volume center, that um, using this measurement, we wanted to try to figure out, could we identify this at-risk population? And that at-risk population was defined as those needing multiple operations, requiring a fusion surgery, or needing ventral brainstem decompression, like taking out the top of C2. So our hypothesis was pretty simple for this. Uh, we wanted to know if the sagittal relationship, the CC2 SVA, can help us predict clinical behavior. Um, pretty straightforward. So this was a single center study uh, performed at Primary Children's Hospital in association with the University of Utah from 2015 to 2017. The CC2 SVA was measured for each patient, and this was done by two different observers. And uh, based on prior experience and really just trial and error, we uh, came up with a CC2 SVA of greater than or equal to five millimeters uh, as an outcome. And uh, this was uh, basically what we wanted to determine if there's any cl clinically important phenomena that lie, lie downstream from this. We also measured the traditional things that we look at in kids with Chiari, including PBC2 and CXA. And we also looked at control data on 30 other subjects who had MRIs for other reasons, but no diagnosis of Chiari. The primary outcome was multiple reoperations or the need for occipital cervical fusion or ventral brainstem decompression. 
So this uh, paper was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. And this table on the left, I'm not going to get into the details with you because it's frankly not too important, but what I want to highlight is what I've highlighted here, is looking at between kids with Chiari malformation and controls, you can see that the mean CC2SVA was higher in the Chiari group, and this finding was statistically significant. Then coming over to the right, we want to see the proportion of kids that has a CC2 SVA greater than or equal to five millimeters. And we again found that this was statistically higher in the Chiari cohort versus the control cohort. So at this point, we thought we were onto something and said, okay, the controls are definitely different than kids with Chiaris. Let's take it a step further. In this series, uh, seven patients required either occipital cervical fusion of their spine or odontoid resection. Um, because of persistent brainstem compression, symptoms, etc. And we found in those who required fusion or odontoid resection that all of them had a CC2 SVA greater than or equal to 5 millimeters, which was a significant finding. So given this, we wanted to go back to our test characteristics and see, well, What's the magnitude of this finding? Does it have any implications for screening? And the sensitivity um, for a CC2 SVA greater than or equal to five millimeters was 100%, which is great. Um, and for the CXA, it was 71%. And for the PBC2, it was 71%. So at this point, we also wanted to look and see, well, of the kids that are getting fused, um, you know, is there a time component, meaning uh, are these kids needing, needed to be treated faster? And we did find using a Kaplan-Meier analysis that the time to treatment was shorter, and this was also significant in the CC2 SVA greater than or equal to five millimeter group. So at this point, we, you know, we thought this was worthwhile to put out there and, and thought that the CC2 SVA as a novel measurement was associated with a more complex Chiari phenotype, and it could predict a need for uh, occipital cervical fusion or ventral brainstem decompression with a sensitivity of 100%. It's a simple measurement. It can be done on one MRI scan, and to be able to be used as a screening test to help identify kids in the clinical setting that may or may not be kind of quote unquote bad actors meaning kids that have more severe Chiaris that need to be kind of paid more attention to, monitored more frequently, or treated more aggressively up front. So anytime you develop uh, anything like this, it needs to be validated on a much larger scale. And that is what we aimed to do um, with the next part of this talk, um, which is um, a multi-center validation of the CC2 SVA using the Park Reef Syringo Myelia Research Consortium. So, as I mentioned previously, this was all what I talked about in the previous slides: is that the CC2 SVA was predictive for acquiring occipital cervical fusion and ventral brainstem decompression. The primary aim of this study was to validate these findings on a large multi-center external cohort, keyword being external, um, using uh, the Park Reef Syringomyelia Research Consortium. Our hypothesis was a little more bold this time. Um, we wanted to uh, seek if the CC2 SVA would identify these at-risk children for requiring occipital cervical fusion or ventral brainstem decompression or reoperation for posterior fossa decompression. And we hypothesized that it would have superior test characteristics compared to the other commonly used measures, including the CXA and PBC2. Now, you all know about the Parker Reef Syringo Myelia Research Consortium. This is a wonderful endeavor um, spearheaded by the team at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, that's an ambispect of registry from 36 centers across the country with over 1,200 patients enrolled um, who present for management of Chiari 1 malformation with syringo myelia. Uh, this includes patients who underwent posterior fossa decompression with or without duroplasty from June of 2011 to May of 2016. Um, and we identified patients who underwent 
occipital cervical fusion and ventral brainstem decompression. And then using the database due to its vast patient enrollment, we were able to identify 10 age and gender matched controls for comparison, which is really fantastic. Uh, the primary outcome was the need for occipital cervical fusion or ventral brainstem, de uh, ventral brainstem decompression, excuse me. So in this study, just similar to the single center study, we looked at the CXA and PBC2. These were measured a priori by a central reader and confirmed by a board certified neuroradiologist at the primary site. And uh, C the CC2 SVA was measured by three different authors. And this was done using proprietary software called ITK SNAP. You have a chance to look at this. It's really fantastic software that you can use and do all kinds of measurements on. So by treating the CC2 SPA greater than five millimeters as a screening test, we were able to calculate these test characteristics, including the sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value. And we did the same for CXA and PBC2. Um, we uh, looked at the log rank test for time to event. And we also calculated a measure of inner rate of reliability, which helps kind of determine you know, how well Rater A, Rater B, and Rater C agreed with one another to see how well this could be employed in common practice. So from this study and this VASCO, where we were able to get a much bigger sample than the original study, 186 patients were in the uh, control group or comparison group who underwent posterior fossa decompression only, and 20 uh, children underwent ventral brainstem decompression and occipital cervical fusion. You can see from the baseline characteristics here that there was no real difference in any of the dem demographics, including age, gender, race, follow-up time, the length and characteristics of the syrinx, which makes it really good in terms of its comparison. So when we look at uh, uh, the comparison groups, we see that the mean CC2 SVA was significantly higher in the group requiring ventral brainstem decompression occipital cervical fusion versus those undergoing posterior decompression only. And this was also a significant finding. And the CXA was also significantly different as well. Next, um, we uh, looked at the proportion of children that uh, had a CC2 SVA greater than or equal to five millimeters. And we found that 100% uh, of children in the ventral brainstem decompression group had a CC2 SVA of greater than or equal to five millimeters. Now, we also found that the CXA less than 125 showed a significantly, a, a significant association between those needing uh, ventral brainstem decompression and fusion versus not. Going to the test characteristics, uh, we found a sensitivity again of 100% for the CC2 SVA versus CXA of 55% and PBC2 of 20%. So when we looked at the inner rate of reliability, basically how well we agreed with one another, we found that there was moderate agreement um, for the continuous variable. And for the binary measurements, we found that there was uh, a high level of agreement, but it could have been better. And so um, this is something that we really wanted to pay attention to in this to see what the feasibility of employing this measurement on a broad spectrum would be. So, uh, to conclude this part of the study, we have successfully validated the CC2 SBA on a multicenter cohort. We found that it was highly associated with a more complex Chiari phenotype and predictive of the need for OC fusion or ventral brainstem decompression with a sensitivity of 100%. This is a simple measurement that can aid in predicting clinical behavior and should be used as a screening test when evaluating Chiari patients. Now, future directions, uh, we definitely want to track this in a prospective fashion to see how it's performing. And I uh, think more than anything, emphasis on health-related quality of life metrics in uh, children undergoing Chiari surgery and, and monitoring these metrics as a function of these measurements that we rely on so much is extremely important because without those health-related quality of life metrics, all of this is meaningless. Um, Further teaching and education on measuring the CC2 SVA as our inner rate of reliability could have been better. It certainly was within acceptable range, but certainly can be better. And I think uh, teaching about that will help. 
And in terms of just painting with broad strokes, uh, looking at the soft tissue contributions on biomechanics in Chiari patients is going to be really important. Um, the ligamentous structures, the musculature, how the complex interplay affects the craniocervical junction, and again, how they correlate to severity of symptoms and health-related quality of life uh, will definitely be important moving forward. Um, I wanted to thank you guys for the opportunity to present this uh, short kind of abbreviated talk today about some of the work we've been doing and what we continue to do. And uh, now I guess we'll open it up to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Avenger. Before I turn my camera back on, there was a question. Um, could you just run through how the CC2 SVA is measured again on imaging? Maybe just a quick explainer. Absolutely. So let me take uh, take this back here, and we'll just go here. Yeah. So um, basically, this this would best be done on a um, on an MRI scan of the cervical spine, but it can certainly be done in an MRI of the brain as well. And starting on the left panel here, you can see this is basically a sagittal cut, um, and it's directly in the midline. And so you see we have a very nice view of the spinal cord and the craniocervical junction. And here you can appreciate the tonsillar descent as is seen in Chiari malformation. And so what we do is we, uh, using our imaging software, you take a line uh, and you draw it per, or parallel to the C23 disc here. You can see that yellow line is going right through the C23 disc space. Now on panel two on the right side here, what this image is, is either on the right or left side, um, you want to find the occipital cervical joint, which is indicated here by this star. And uh, it's really kind of a cup-shaped joint. And um, you want to identify the midpoint of that joint. And then using either, you can use a piece of paper or a marker using uh, your imaging software. And you want to bring your image back to the midline where you have your parallel line to the C23 disc, and you've got this plumb line or this perpendicular line from that star or that midpoint, and that is really the money of the measurement. And then where the line intersects to the back of the C23 disc is how we measure the, the CC2 SVA. So it takes looking in the midline and kind of going off parasagittally to find the middle point of that occipital cervical joint or the OC joint. And that's how you measure it. I hope that clears it up a little bit. I know it's a little hard in 2D imaging to figure it out. Um, if I was there with you scrolling through it, it's a really easy thing to do. Great, thank you so much. Um, I actually have a question. Um, have you, I guess I, I'm assuming it's not published yet, but have you looked at this measurement in um, a Chiari population that doesn't have syringomyelia. So I know you have that small cohort that was at Utah, but have you done this maybe internally either at Utah or at your current institution, just kind of looking at it without syrin syrinx patients? No, that's a that's a wonderful question. Um, so this um, the second part of this just recently was uh, accepted for publication in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics, just like the first one. And one of the limitations of it is, you know, the the uh, Park Reeves Syringomyelia Consortium is great, but it only includes kids that have syringomyelia. So looking at uh, kids with Chiari malformation without syrinxes is definitely what we need to do next. Um, and it's, it's in our plan in the pipeline, but it's an excellent question. And I think um, it definitely is worth mentioning and I'm really glad that you mentioned it actually. Yeah, um, cause I'm thinking in my head about how we can help you make it happen. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, but, no, that's, um, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, a question came out, the, so what's considered normal versus abnormal? And is it just that five, it, it's, I feel like it's a little triggering, the five millimeter thing, because Chiari patients have that five millimeter rule that isn't really a rule for the cerebellar descent. So is it just right now, it's just binary, correct? Right now, it's just binary. binary. You know, we've looked at uh, the continuous variable and definitely noted a trend of, increased CC2 SVA in more, you know, severe uh, Chiari cases. 
um, as you all know, uh, you know, Chiari is a spectrum, you know, it's, it's, Chiari is not a binary disease by any means. And so to think about it with a binary measurement uh, probably doesn't do it its complete justice, but it's a stepping stone in the right direction for sure. Um, so that five millimeters, uh, it is what we're working from for now, but we, we acknowledge that there is gray area there, and I think it needs to be taken in the whole context. You know, one thing we want to avoid is practitioners looking at Chiari uh, patients and looking at an MRI and saying, okay, the CC2 SVA is six, you need to have fusion right now. That is definitely not what we want to happen, but we want it to trigger a little bit further of thought process with it. Okay, the CC2 SVA is, is a little bit bigger than what it should be. Maybe we need to look into if there's any instability at the occipital cervical junction. We should get some flexion extension films. We should maybe monitor this kid a little bit more carefully and follow up with more frequent MRI scans or things like that. So as a screening test, you leave yourself open to quite a bit, right? You don't want to say if X, then Y, um, but we want it to trigger a thought process of this, this Chiari malformation may be a bad actor. Let's keep an eye on it or think about it a little more carefully. Mm. A really good question just came in. So did you notice any trends with connective tissue disorders? Were you able to account for any of that? Yeah, so uh, we we did look at that and we haven't noticed any trends with connective tissue disorders yet. And I say yet because kids with connective dis tissue disorders among the Chiari population, although it's common, it's still rare. And so um, uh, in order to study it really and give it justice, our sample size needs to be much, much bigger. And so I think uh, as we grow this and try to recruit more patients and prospectively collect this data, connective tissue disorder relationships will be elucidated. Do I have an inclination that connective tissue disorders probably play a role in this? Probably. Um, but from the data we have so far, I, I don't think we can sign on the dotted line yet. And I think it would be irresponsible to do so until we can study it properly. Yeah, absolutely. Like one thing I do kind of want to remind everyone still is that this is basically a brand new uh, metric for people to use potentially in the clinic. So there's a lot of research that's still got to get done on it, but it seems really, really interesting. Um, I guess, is there a specific, this has kind of come up before, so is there a specific set of symptoms that you would want to see in a patient before you looked at this measurement or are you just thinking maybe this is something you measure on all patients that come in with a Chiari or a suspected Chiari um, or is there a particular set of symptoms that you're thinking might be um, might trigger you to measure this? Yeah it's a really good question you know in in uh, in actuality I think the best <clears throat> way to use this measurement would be to measure it on everybody um, who comes in for evaluation of a Chiari who has appropriate imaging that can be looked at and uh, because it is an easy and quick measurement to make. That being said, um, you know, children that come in with more severe symptoms, uh, kind of bulbar type symptoms, brainstem compression, uh, you know, swallowing difficulties, diplopia, stuff like that, definitely their C2 positioning is something that is going to be uh, much more of interest than a standard incidental finding of a Chiari 1 malformation with no symptoms. So certainly the symptoms will, will guide the interest in the regional anatomy, but um, I would like this to be kind of commonplace for every kid with a Chiari who gets a evaluation with a uh, a neurosurgeon to to have this measurement performed because of the three measurements, I, I personally think it's just as easy as the CXA, if not easier, um, and the PBC2. And those measurements definitely have merit. I, I don't want to take away from those at all. Um, but I think the beauty of this is we're trying to take some of the um, properties from spinal deformity surgery, specifically in the adult realm, which this has become really, really um, influential on and translate it to uh, pediatric craniocervical anomalies, which Chiari is the most common. Yeah. Um, 
So you mentioned it quickly, and uh, I'm sorry if you don't have this with you, so don't feel obligated to <laughs> know the answer. But you talked about positive predictive value and negative predictive value, which for people who don't do this, um, that means how likely it is to, well, the first one is how likely it is to correctly identify. Uh, I guess at this point it was, what was your outcome? It was need for um, a second surgery? The need for uh, fusion or ventral brain stem decompression. Okay, and then the other would be how accurate it predicts that that's not the case. So do you have those numbers or what was yeah. that? You know, I don't have that two by two table um, with me. Give me one second. I'm just trying to see if I... And if you just want to kind of give an overview, that's fine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, based on that, so, you know, positive predictive value, you know, as it's defined as kind of the true positives uh, divided by true positives plus false positives, right? So it's anybody who tested positive if they actually had a positive test. Um, and so I, I wish I had this in front of me, I apologize. Um, I do remember the positive predictive value being being quite good. Um, and for a, a sensitive, you know, for, for a screening test to have a high sensitivity to rule out a problem is definitely uh, the preferred thing that you want. Um, and you'll notice on this slide here, um, and, and I was just speaking about the CXA, that the, the CXA lesson 125, if you look at the specificity, the specificity was fantastic, 99%. So that's why I think taking all these measurements and using them in, in conglomeration with the clinical picture is really beneficial. So if you have a CC2 SVA greater than or equal to five millimeters, and uh, that's great, that's a good screening test, and then confirmatory could be your CXA in addition to the clinical information. And I think that's the important thing about these test characteristics. Sensitivity helps you rule things out, specificity helps you rule things in, and positive and negative predictive value tell you how often if you have the result, either positive or negative, it's gonna be right. I wish I had the numbers in front of me, I apologize, I will email them to you afterwards. That's fine. I, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. I was just curious because no, this is it's what a I do. fantastic question. It's a fantastic question. Um, so a couple of questions came in ahead. I Do you mind if we go through those a little bit? Please, yeah, go ahead. So one of them is, since we're kind of on the subject of measurements, are there specific measurements that you're using in your clinic right now for Chiari patients or syrinx patients or maybe even patients with connective tissue disorders that might have some of that instability that needs to be corrected? Yeah, so I, I am using the, the CC2 SVA, um, not solely, but I, I do look at that and I, I do put a lot of stock in the CXA also, um, connective dis tissue disorder or not. Now, um, in folks with connective tissue disorders, I'll tell you, I'm a little more aggressive about uh, obtaining dynamic imaging on them um, in terms of flexion extension x-rays and uh, flexion extension MRI scans um, to see what the frame and magnum looks like when uh, people are really you know, enduring a physiologic stress. So um, that would be my answer to that. And I, and I think it's important, like you said, you know, we don't take any of these measurements in isolation because that would just be, um, you know, kind of a silly thing to do. I think you have to look at a patient's symptom pattern, chronicity, severity, and uh, definitely take the neurological examination and put it all together. But I do look at all these measurements uh, and, and uh, you know, go through them with patients as we evaluate this because I think it's important they understand what we're looking at too. Um, there's a question, does instability in like the upper part of the spine cause different problems for, than an instability maybe in a lower part of the spine? So I, I, I feel bad doing this, but so the upper cervical part versus the lower cervical versus thoracic or lumbar, which is basically everything, but um, is, those are all going to cause different problems, right? Yeah, yeah, it's all going to cause different problems, and we do think about them, you know, it's it's all related to spinal stability, but but you're absolutely right, we think about them quite a bit differently. Um, when you talk about cervical instability, um, specifically uh, at the craniocervical junction, 
it's either in the setting of someone who's had a trauma or some kind of congenital malformation of the cranial cervical junction. So we're paying extra close attention to that. In the latter part, which I kind of put Chiari malformation in that, um, uh, you want to really ensure that there's not a predisposition for any kind of spinal cord injury uh, or, or something like that. Now, when it comes to lower down in the cervical spine, those are typically things that if they were to be diagnosed, they would have been diagnosed at that point. Um, and uh, lumbar spine instability is typically something that presents a little bit later on. Um, and we're a little, I would say, more conservative with management of that. So if someone has, let's say, spondylolisthesis in their spine, um, where they're slipping their vertebrae one on top of another, unless they have severe back pain or neurological signs or symptoms related to it, people aren't in a rush to operate on them because a lot of them will be quiescent forever. Um, and only a small percentage will come to fruition. Um, but versus in the cervical spine, if there's any evidence of instability, the goal is more to prevent neurological injury because of the devastating effects that it could have. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Brockmeyer was where you, he, you took your residency with him. So he talked a lot about complex Chiari. And there's a question, is, is a syrinx always associated with that? And if so, is there a specific part of the spine where that syrinx is, has to be for it to be considered that or? No, the, the complex Chiari is something that uh, Dr. Brockmeyer really has done a lot of work on. And um, there, it, it does not have to be associated with the syrinx. It commonly is, but it certainly does not. And the location of the syrinx uh, is not really something that's, that's predictable. So it often will extend from the cervical spine into the cervical thoracic junction, but in some kids with uh, complex Chiari's, you'll see just an isolated thoracic syrinx. Um, and we don't really understand why that is, and we think it's probably related to uh, inherent weakness in the spinal cord anatomy, and it's just taking the path of least resistance, and that's where it ends up. So um, the answer to your question is, uh, no, you don't need to have a syrinx to have a complex Chiari, and the location of the syrinx is variable, um, but that's why we image the entire spine when we're working these things up, to make sure that we're not missing an occult syrinx that could be from an upstream problem. Oh, that was really good. Um, so a very specific question, is there a relationship between uh, craniocervical instability and muscle spasms in the neck and the upper back, and can those muscle spasms make instability or its symptoms worse? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so instability itself, uh, you know, our, our body will try to compensate for it. So uh, kids that have instability or chronic instability will probably have a component of chronic neck pain. And the reason that happens is because the muscles are trying to do the work that the bones and the ligaments are trying to do. And so you do get some muscle spasming as a result of that. Now, that's a protective mechanism. It certainly doesn't make the instability worse. In fact, it probably uh, makes it better and safer, um, but it's also very uncomfortable. So I, I certainly think there's uh, a relationship with instability and, and neck pain, neck stiffness due to muscle spasm. As far as treating that, other other than getting the instability addressed, it, is that just over-the-counter medication or? Yeah, there's a variety of things. Um, you know, over-the-counter medication with anti-inflammatories. Um, one thing that uh, that um, we used to do in residency for kids that have uh, this type of pain is something called trigger point injections can be very beneficial. Um, finding specific spots where the muscles are sore and um, really, uh, you know, either infiltrating a small amount of lidocaine or steroid in that area to help reduce that inflammation can be really beneficial. Um, but I would do that after you trial oral medication, um, you know, heat, stuff like that first, obviously. There's actually a question, this is more about pressure. <clears throat> um, how often does a person after a fusion experience, is, is it common to experience pressure issues in the inter intracranial pressure, so high or low, they're, they're asking about. Yeah, so, you know, folks that, uh, so I assume this is in the setting of Chiari malformation, right? Right. Uh, yeah, so, you know, kids that have uh, Chiari surgery um, and undergo a posterior fossa decompression, at that point, 
uh, their treating physician has more than likely uh, ruled out increased intracranial pressure. Um, and, and even if they haven't come out and said it, in their mind, they've ruled it out um, for a variety of reasons, whether it's MRI or symptom pattern or uh, lack of optic nerve swelling or something like that. So um, the fusion surgery itself or a Chiari surgery itself should not affect um, intracranial pressure to some degree. Um, unless there's underlying hydrocephalus that's not treated, then the Chiari surgery um, can, you know, can exacerbate it and you can have a CSF leak that just won't heal um, or, um, you know, persistent symptoms that, that can be dangerous. So um, the fusion surgery and Chiari surgery per, per se aren't related to increased intracranial pressure, only that if you're going to have Chiari surgery um, and or a fusion, uh, likely at that point, your practitioner has ruled out or is ruling out hydrocephalus uh, as a primary cause of the Chiari. Um, how accurate are ICP bolts for measuring high pressure? And is there a difference if you put the bolt in a different spot? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. T typically, so intracranial pressure monitors are very um, that's that's been shown in multiple studies so far and location uh, typically doesn't matter. Um, what matters is the the uh, length of measurement. Um, so taking a single ICP measurement in one sitting, um, it, you know, it may or may not give you an idea of, of what's going on if you're really worried about something. Um, if you're going to go to the trouble to put an ICP monitor in, typically that will be left in for at least a day. Um, and uh, then you can get an idea of how the intracranial pressure is trending over time. You know, when, when we're giving a talk or, or you know, um, performing an activity like lifting up something heavy, of course our intracranial pressure is going to be elevated. And then we're, when we're resting, watching TV, um, it's going to be quite a bit lower. So there's definitely normal physiologic oscillations that we need to account for. Um, but I think ICP monitoring is, itself is a very fruitful activity and uh, it's very, very accurate. So you, one of the outcomes of your, well, one of the things that you're, time to eventing, uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I'm not being clear, but reoperations. So how mm -hmm. frequent are reoperations in Chiari? And if you have one reoperation, are you like more likely to need another one later on? Yeah, so reoperations in Chiari, um, you know, the, the rate of reoperation is, is a little bit difficult. And I think a lot of this information will be uh, sussed out with the Park Reeves Syringomyelia Research Consortium study uh, because they really looked at posterior fossa decompression with and without duroplasty. And one of the main things that they were able to garner is the reoperation rates. And um, so I think a lot of information will come from that in terms of the actual rate of reoperation itself. If you have one reoperation, does that make you more prone to another reoperation? You know, every time you operate, you create a little bit more scar tissue. And so the risk of, of that certainly is there. That being said, if you had originally underwent a posterior fossa decompression without duroplasty, and then you required reoperation with duroplasty, that doesn't make your risk any higher. Um, so, you know, the answer to your question is there is no good answer right now, but I'm excited to see the results of the Park Reeves study as things move forward. And I think that some of those questions will be answered very directly from those papers. Um, here's a question that just came in. If a patient already had a cervical cervical fusion before, knowing that they have a Chiari or brainstem compression, um, are are they able to have the second surgery to then address the Chiari or the brainstem compression afterward? Okay, so they've already had the occipital cervical fusion um, and they need to potentially now have a Chiari decompression or um, brainstem decompression. So is that safe or is that something that should have been addressed first? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. And, and uh, I'll tell you, a lot of this is practitioner and style dependent. So in, in a kid um, that had a Chiari malformation um, 
and if it's severe enough to warrant occipital cervical fusion, likely what would happen is they undergo the Chiari decompression immediately followed, meaning in the same sitting, by the occipital cervical fusion. I'll tell you, the more common scenario is that a child underwent a Chiari decompression and then healed from that, developed recurrent symptoms, and at that point might have underwent a redo Chiari decompression or an occipital cervical fusion at that time. Okay. And that's the more common scenario that, that I, I see and I would do, um, you know, to give a, a, a kid a chance first with a, just a decompression, not fusion first, and then see how they do. And then if they have recurrent symptoms or progressive symptoms, then go back and fuse them at a later date and time. Um, to do the fusion up front uh, and then go back and do the Chiari operation later, it certainly is doable. It's technically very difficult to do um, and can be quite challenging. And then ventral brainstem decompression, once, the, um, once a child has been fused and underwent an occipital cervical fusion, a ventral brainstem decompression is totally safe. You go in and, and you want to take out the, uh, the abdontoid process, which is causing the direct compression. Um, if they haven't undergone fusion, they would need to be fused at that time because that's a destabilizing procedure. There's a question about non-surgical management. So do we know what the general rate of success is for conservative management of Chiari? Is, I, I don't know if you have any information even about um, patients who you've measured the CC2 SVA on as well with this context. Yeah, no, you're, you're, I, I, I think it's, your questions are great because you're segueing into the, all the studies that we need to do. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, while we looked at a large cohort of operated or surgically treated Chiari patients, there's a very, very large cohort of uh, non-surgical Chiari patients that we need to figure out what these measurements mean. Um, and I suspect that the CC2 SVA and then will probably be slightly elevated, but not to the point where it was in this paper. And, um, and uh, you know, that's a sect of, of this that we need to definitely focus on for sure. But I don't have that data to, to, to give you a direct answer to your question. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. Um, do you know just, I guess, what neurosurgeons in general kind of assume the general rate of success for conservative management is, though, right now, just in generally speaking? Yeah, I, I think in general, you know, uh, the success rate for someone who doesn't meet criteria for surgery the first time you see them is, is very high um, because at that point, you know, it's really serial monitoring and management. And I can't speak for other practitioners, but based on my training and my experience, you know, kids who come in with a relatively minor Chiari uh, and if they're asymptomatic and we do conservative treatment, I tend to image them on a yearly basis. And I encourage the families to keep a diary of symptoms um, because, you know, kids have headaches. Everybody gets headaches once in a while. And so it's important to, to chronicle those things. Um, but I think if they don't meet the criteria for surgery on the first time around, I think the success rate of conservative management is probably quite high. It's, if I had to put a percentage on it, you know, it's probably upwards of 70% um, and probably even higher than that. Um, but, um, you know, I think it all just depends on the severity of the Chiari based on radiographic features, but most importantly, what the kid looks like. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Do you, um, how long, this is a question we get a lot, how, how long do you generally wait if the Chiari symptoms are mild before you say, okay, well, this is um, obviously bothering you enough that maybe a surgery would be helpful? Yeah, I, I uh, there's not a specific time period. I, you know, if it's a if it's a severe Chiari, if there's evidence of a syrinx or if there's any neurological sequelae that's already occurred, I, I expedite surgery um, pretty quickly. Um, in in kids that are just what I call the borderline cases, um, and uh, you know they may have some mild symptoms, but it's not a slam dunk. I will uh, tell the to parents to keep uh, you know a diary for a month or two. Uh, and really chronicle the symptoms, you know, when, when they go out and play soccer, or whatever they're doing, and, uh, you know, if they have a headache after or, or what kind of symptoms they have. And then we kind of meet back up and talk about it. And at that point, the parents have had 
enough time to really consider it and, and look at the symptoms as we kind of look at them as surgeons and say, okay, what are we seeing? Is this more consistent with a Chiari type of problem or is it more consistent with a, uh, it's probably just general aches and pains and, you know, a kid who's going through the normal motions type of thing. And inevitably after that couple month period, the parents and I tend to agree on where we are. Um, and so kids that are in the in-between area, I kind of make them, in that sense, declare themselves for surgery because at that point, I think they'll have a benefit and the parents are convinced that, yeah, the symptoms kind of make sense now that we've paid a little more attention to them. Mm -hmm. um, as far as follow-up, this is another question we get a lot, especially for the pediatrics. Um, how long do you follow patients up, especially the younger ones and even the adolescents? Is there a certain length of time that you personally see them or do you have them go to see a neurologist more regularly maybe um, just to get uh, long-term information? But what would you say? Yeah, so, so I'm lucky at our institution, most of, our, uh, most of the Chiari patients that I see um, come from either pediatricians as an incidental finding or from the neurologist directly, so they're already hooked in. Um, I think it's important to follow these on a yearly basis and, and so I will follow kids until they're they're aged out. Um, and if it's if it's an intermediate Chiari, if it's a minor Chiari, I might do a picture, uh, you know, one or two times, so one or two years. And if things look stable and the kid or child is excelling, then I think we can back off at that point with an open ticket to come back if there's a problem. Um, so I don't have a cookbook on it, but for intermediate kids, I would say every year until they age out. And if it's a minor Chiari, I'll watch it to make sure it's not going to progress. And then, um, you know, we'll, we'll probably ease up on them after a year or two. Okay. What about, um, so I guess this is more for the cuspers or the ones that aren't doing quite as well. Um, how do you transfer from so the pediatric clinic to, I think you also see adults, I'm not sure, but is, is it easier for you? Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a good question. Um, at uh, the University of Utah, there is a, a really great system uh, to transition uh, folks to an adult surgeon that would follow Chiari patients, and, and he had a real passion for it. He does have a real passion for it. Um, here, I'm fortunate, and I get to take care of both adults and kids with Chiari malformation, so it's not an issue right now. But I think it's important to do a, you know, a direct handoff, and luckily at most academic centers and big neurosurgical groups across the country, uh, the adult and pediatric sides are well in tune with one another, and so transitioning that care is, is usually a matter of just a phone call and a handshake most times. Um, uh, and and that's what I would hope, but I think it's continuity care is, is definitely important in this setting. So you talked a little bit about the time to treatment was shorter in the patients with the higher CC2 SBAs. Um, was there any, did, were there any symptoms that might have predicted that? Uh, did you look at any of that? I guess it's confounding. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so it's it's a fantastic question. So inherently, um, these are all kids with uh, not complex Chiari. So these are all Chiari 1, kind of, you know, what you would call simple Chiaris, but no Chiari is simple, obviously. Um, but but not, not a, uh, you know, um, complex Chiari. And so we did not look at severity of symptoms as one of the things here, but you're absolutely right. So if a kid has more severe symptoms, of course they're going to be treated more quickly. So we wanted to keep this as a purely radiographic study to really drill down the use of the CC2 SVA as a, as a screening tool. Um, I think if we wanted to take this a step further, definitely could take clinical symptoms with radiographic data, put them together and come up with some kind of composite model into, uh, okay, so patient X has a CC2 SVA of seven and they have swallowing difficulty and they have sleep apnea. So they should be treated X or Y or Z. That would be the ultimate goal of all this once we're able to suss everything out piecemeal. So um, it's, it's, yeah, I, I, you're asking great questions. I feel like I'm I'm handing you cards to ask these questions because these are all the studies. These are all the studies that we're thinking about in our mind. So yeah, and then I'm going to ask one more probably impossible question. Then I'm going to get a similar. <laughs> but um, 
we always get questions and I actually have one here that says, can an MRI, oh my gosh, can an MRI report say everything is quote normal in a Chiari situation? So there's no Chiari, but there's obvious symptoms. So the question is, why does this happen? And I guess I'll add on to that. Is that something that this measurement would address? I, Cause I'm not entirely sure about how the, literally the space, the anatomy would work with that if there's no clear Chiari? Yeah, so if there's no clear Chiari, um, the measurement itself will work, um, you know, in the absence of a Chiari or not. Um, you can certainly look at it. Um, and if the symptoms are truly characteristic, you know, there is the phenomenon uh, out there and it's written about the Chiari zero, right? Um, and it's certainly something that uh, pediatric neurosurgeons and adult neurosurgeons uh, see and, and, and consider. And so, yeah, an MRI can be normal, um, but can there still be abnormalities at the cranial, craniocerebral junction that could be contributing to symptoms? Absolutely. Um. I'm going to give everyone two seconds just in case there's one more question that we want to get in. But otherwise, I am going to ask you the question I ask everyone. <laughs> How can people get in touch with you? Um, I know with COVID, this, the rules are kind of weird, but um, are you seeing patients, new patients? Um, are you allowed to see patients out of state that might come in? How does that work? Yeah, so my primary practice is at the military hospital right now. Um, and I do work at Rady Children's Hospital uh, and definitely taking new patients and things like that. So um, the best way to get a hold of us, uh, I guess, would be uh, via telephone to the, to the Rady Children's Hospital or uh, via email. If you go on the website, there's an email address there. Um, and uh, that would be really the best way. Um, and I want to thank you guys for having me and continue doing the great work that you're doing. And uh, I. I assure you, we will figure this out, so. I, we did get one under the wire question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this this person's son was decompressed two years ago and now has um, peripheral neuropathy. So are, should they follow up with a neurologist or a neurosurgeon? Good question. Um, my, my stock answer for that is, is really both. I would see your neurosurgeon first. Um, just to ensure that there is nothing structural. With peripheral neuropathy has lots of different causes. It's one of those things that you need to think a lot about because there's a lot of things that could be going on. But as a surgeon who treated a kid, you know, I would want to make sure structurally that there's uh, nothing going on uh, or, you know, any kind of adverse um, uh, problem with the decompression or things like that. And then once that has been completely ruled out, then I would seek the care of a neurologist um, because they will likely think about things that surgeons won't. And that's just the, the God honest truth about it. So, um, uh, but uh, that, that would be my advice. Awesome. Thank you. And just to reiterate, I guess, um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, they would go to Rady, R-A-D-Y, right? Yes. Um, and okay. and you're, you're more than welcome to share my email as well. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much, Dr. Avendra. Everyone's saying thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. It was a really interesting paper. And I, please stay in touch because I have different ideas about how we can maybe <laughs> keep validating it. Um, yeah, but thank absolutely. You. No, I, I appreciate the uh, opportunity and thank you for all the great work you do. Thank you.